I'm very excited to welcome the two forces behind Apache Hudi. Uh, today we have Vinoth uh, Chandar, and uh, Vinoth is the VP of Apache Hudi, and also a principal engineer at Confluent, where he's working on Kafka performance and stream processing. And uh, we also have Nishith, uh, who is also um, very involved in the uh, Apache Hudi project. Um, he's an engineering manager at Uber, and he's also a PMC of the Apache Hootie project. So guys, um, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thanks for having us, Pete. So I was looking over the, the Hootie site, and um, one of the things that jumped out at me, I'm always sensitive to how a project like this um, immediately positions itself. And so I read that uh, Apache Hootie ingests and manages storage of large analytical data sets over distributed file systems. Um, what, what does that mean exactly? Sort of kick us off by explaining at a high level um, what the main idea of Hootie is. So, um, so the core business problem that Hootie tries to solve is to make your uh, data lake much more cheaper, cheaper, much more scalable, and sort of like more capable. It also brings like more database-like features uh, to the data lake. Um, without actually sacrificing the cost and scalability that these data lakes are actually great for, right? So stepping into that a little bit, what that description, uh, which I think can be improved upon, <laughs> is basically trying to say is we, we've we tried to build uh, the core like tech kernel for Huli, which may, helps you, you know, perform updates, deletes, give incremental chain streams out of tables, which kind of, uh, are the core technical capabilities, but also we have you know ingestion tools, a lot of data management tools, which actually help you build uh, a data lake, which is sort of like you know a lot more cost effective as as you as you mean. So Hudi as a project, um, you know it also aims to uh, it, it gives you the core set of like technical capabilities like updates, deletes, and you know. And, but also provides the necessary tools and components like ingestion tool. We have an incremental ETL tool. We have data management tools for compaction. We're working on clustering data based on query patterns and stuff. Uh, we have tools that can take backup restore of data sets. And I, I could see Hoodie, you know, eventually adding data monitoring capabilities, uh, like a data deletion library uh, that we see that it's a common thing across users to, that use Hoodie. Uh, to be doing like you know GDPRs like privacy regulation compliant data deletion operations, and maybe even a meta server that can like you know give you all this information across your ecosystem. So that's kind of like how where 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 we are going. We're trying to build stuff around the kernel of Hudi. That's a, that's a lot of stuff, and um, <laughs> I'm I'm excited to dig into those um, bits uh, through the conversation. Um, now, Vinoth, if I recall. Um, you might have kicked things off with a blog post in 2016. I think it was August 2016, about four years ago, um, on incremental processing over Hadoop. Um, at the time, did you understand like what a big impact this could make? Um, I think at a very technical level, I, I, I did actually. Uh, but not not from like a, you know from an industry perspective how like uh, you know um, ubiquitous this pattern would become uh, because I I came from so the short uh, kind of like origin story here is that so my background before I came to Uber was I worked on database replication in Oracle where you know I'm very familiar with CDC streams and stream processing or those things in general. Then at LinkedIn, uh, my role was building a key value store. So I knew databases and data aggregation very well. And we started to build a data, like, you know, started to ingest data uh, incrementally from databases at Uber. And then we, you know, hit this fundamental impedance mismatch where everything until that point can be done very incrementally, except for when you try to, like, you know, ingest data onto HDFS or, you know, these Hadoop compatible storage. Uh, so the technically, I, it was very clear to us from the get-go that if we solve this, we are going to get back a lot of compute resources back. Uh, our ETLs are going to be like much, much, much cheaper. We weren't, uh, so most of that blog post was kind of 
uh, I was mostly writing it for myself to seek more uh, kind of, you know, industry sort of feedback because this sort of thing hasn't been done in the, the, the kind of the HDFS analytics land before. While coming from a database background, it just seemed very natural to me to do something like that. Um, but uh, we, until the, the recent, I think the GDPR and the privacy law regulations that force companies to kind of have penalties uh, as a percentage of their revenue, that whole thing kind of changed the adoption curve for these technologies. Um, because uh, before that, we would see people who were kind of like nodding their head, oh yeah, we should do everything incrementally. Uh, but then the, the, the probably like, you know, think of it as an optimization, not more like something that you need to design your data lake for from ground up. So I think uh, the GDPR uh, regulations and the, the, you know, the CCPA, the privacy law regulations uh, have had a, like a massive impact on taking these kind of technologies mainstream, I would say. Mm -hmm. And and so, um, Nishith, you were previously a software engineer at Cisco. Um, I think you were probably at Walmart Labs around the time that um, that uh, Vinal's post was was first published. Um, yeah. How did you how did you get dragged into Apache Foodie? Yeah, I I actually joined uh, like right about the time just before uh, the blog was published. So I I remember. Um, so I was mostly working on data infrastructure stuff, um, like a lot of low level of Cassandra, you know, migrating like, you know, traditional Oracle stuff to Cassandra. Uh, and then um, I was very interested in sort of like how like the database world works. And I worked a lot about like tombstones, tunings in Cassandra, et cetera. And um, I was, I was trying to understand, and, and we were also moving this data to, you know, the big data back in the day when I was working at one more labs and, and uh, to me, it was very intriguing, like, you know, how to sort of merge these concepts of this database onto the, onto the big data part. Uh, like, why can't we simply port this? Like, what's, what's the gating factor? And like, I think right about the time when I joined, like, uh, you know, just, just, just at the time I joined, like, like Hoodie was like starting off uh, at Uber and, uh, and like, you know, folks over there talk to me about it. And I'm like, yeah, this is exactly what I think about as well. Like, why, why is it, why is it that we can't bring these database semantics, uh, you know, to big data? And so that's how I got involved. Uh, I think, uh, yeah. And, and, you know, when, when we first, when I first joined, I think I remember we used to talk about like, why isn't anybody solving this? Like, like, why isn't this like a solution yet out there? And so we would question ourselves a lot of times and that's where, Sort of the, the the blog post came out to get more industry like you know uh, feedback like 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 is there nothing out there which like does these kinds of things um, and 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 yeah and that's how you know I got like deeply involved in the project. So I mean I think we can see how um, the, the 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 hoodie movement or the movement that hoodie um, captured or um, perhaps has has been helpful in articulating was kind of part of this multiple. Um, you know, connection or, or sort of collision of these different data things that were happening at the time, right? There's large amounts of data, there's cheap cloud storage, there's um, everyone getting excited about columnar formats, um, you know, if not Vertica, which was sort of the, the precursor, then, then the more open system or formats like Parquet. Um, at the same time, there's also this explosion in NoSQL and a complete abandonment of any kind of like acid transactions or, um, you know, like uh, no, no real sort of uh, commitment to some, some of the previous database, um, you know, concepts that we had all known and loved. It seems to me like Hudi stepped into this sort of an environment and it's making sense of all of those things, um, attempting to do it in some meaningful, well thought through um, way based on certain design principles that um, I'm sure are, are, are key to you guys and you'll enjoy sharing with us. Is that, is that a fair sort of estimation of what was happening in, in the data world at the time? I think that's actually a very good way to look at it really. Like, uh, so yeah, I, I think that that'll be, that'll be like a fair, a fair estimation. Like before the, I didn't actually, till this point, uh, since you are clear, I didn't think about it as a, oh yeah, we didn't have NoSQL databases before. Uh, and then you had NoSQL databases, but, but the, the, you know, the analytics land hadn't really adapted to that sort of scale, uh, right? Yeah, that, that's, I think, a really good way to uh, uh, put it. Um, I would 
would also add one more thing though, which is uh, the rise of stream processing. Uh, mm -hmm. If you think about it, um, so people typically say analytic data says uh, uh, data sources don't have updates still. Like you know, it shouldn't change. That was the kind of the norm back then. I I I, I remember people would. Uh, so at some point at Uber, we had like more commuters, Hadoop, like the people with more Hadoop, deep Hadoop background than I think even Facebook or other, other like LinkedIn or other like, you know, kind of Hadoop heavy rates uh, have in the industry. And then I get like constantly challenged on, hey, like this thing has been like immutable for like ages and like, you know, the company's built around it. So why, why is it suddenly that we have to solve this problem of updates and deletes? And we actually wrestled with it a lot internally because I was also like, okay, maybe maybe it works. We don't have to bring there semantics here. But I think the clinching argument was, no matter what you do here, connecting back to stream processing, right? The minute you have a derived table that is doing a group by, uh, then you can definitely implement this in a more incremental way that like how you know, a Flink or like a Kafka streams job using a state store would do. Right, rather than the full like, okay, I'm going to recompute my entire days of uh, counts every three hours. Correct. You need not do that. There's a large class of batch ETLs which can simply be written in a very incremental fashion, and you can. And what we saw, and a lot of people at Uber were also uh, tempted. Let me kill my Slack. One second. Well, that living. All right. We're living uh, in the Slack Slack era, um, and and okay. uh, Vinod, just to jump just to jump in briefly, I think this was one of the main points of the post, right? Is that um, right. instead of just thinking about things that are pure batch or pure stream, um, what about this delta of five minute increments to sixty minute increments that um, are actually like there's a lot of real world scenarios scenarios that sort of fit into those that that time window, and why don't we have a system that's better suited? Um, for the, the in-between land, in-between true batch or true stream. Is that right? Correct, correct. And, and in a lot of ways, we were making that up because like, so so at Uber, right, we wanted, uh, like, you know, we, we, we uh, at least, uh, I think maybe like uh, when we started, we were like, okay, let's Google up data, data lake. We found Martin Fowler's like description of what the architecture is, like many other people like you know, him describing what the architecture is. Then he actually tried to implement the architecture where you have a you have to have a derived sort of raw data layer which models the operational systems above, not the business uh, like in, without any business semantics to it, right? Then you build a buffer between these operational systems and their analytics pipelines on the side. But the, whenever people try to write ETLs, uh, if you don't have these do this incrementally, it costs a lot of latency for the batch jobs then you have only two choices. Either you violate the data lake architecture by mm -hmm. directly going to the source or some like thing that has its own data quality problems. Uh, you just like, you know, bypass one layer, right? Because that one layer adds uh, latency or you try to pick subsets of those ETLs and simplify them and then write stream processing jobs because the subset of the data you want in like real time, right? So. But between these, you're now caught between like a, like a rock and a hard place because you either face data quality issues uh, by like, you know, bypassing all the data quality validation checks that we do at the raw data layer, or you are now spending, you know, rocks DB state stores will store data in row based formats, not columnar formats. So you are trading off long running containers, uh, like row based storage at a higher cost, higher premium for latency. Uh, while we thought, okay, wait, like without violating any of the architecture or anything, if all we needed to do was in just bring the stream processing semantics to the the batch data, if you will, because we we've gotten used to thinking about stream and batch that way, and that's kind of where uh, incremental kind of processing really fits. And we tried to make a new term, mostly not to confuse people about. This is not stream processing in a sense that this is um, batch processing in kind of mini micro batches and all of our uh, kind of infrastructure that we build in Hoodie project kind of like, you know, tries to realize that. Uh, if you want like low latency, less than one minute real time use case, just use like, you know, Kafka streams, I think, right? Like that's, that's what will serve that purpose. Uh, if you don't care about like latency at all, <laughs> stick to batch processing, but 
for EDLs are this kind of like pipelines that keep chugging along with new input. We believe that this is a very powerful paradigm to express those uh, those ETLs uh, uh, on. That, that, that's well, the, go, go ahead, Nishas. No, I was just going to add also, like when we were doing this, right, like we realized there is actually a void where um, between this like five minute and like 60 minute, as you put it, like the, if users want five minutes, they have to go to stream processing. If users, uh, and, and, and you know, if you want some of that in between style, you either have the option of batch or stream. And like both of these options are overkills or underkills for that solution. And as we built this, then we realized, okay, a lot of use cases actually fit in between which have a void and they end up going to stream processing. And then the points that Vinod mentioned, you have data quality issues because you are either ingesting them into some online store and then like backing them up. Uh, and then you can't do joins maybe because like that's hard uh, uh, given like you have some stuff in online, then you probably have to curate some of your data and put them in online stores. So that void, I feel like uh, was also something that became more apparent uh, as we were doing this. And so, so then if that's the origin story, um, and if you are embracing this new form of incremental processing, it seems like all the transaction support, all the asset support features over the data lake sort of ultimately were byproducts of this um, sort of architectural paradigm. Uh, sometimes conversely, I've thought of this class of tools, um, Delta Lake and Hudi and others as supporting trans transactions over a data lake. Um, which maybe is one way to think about it, but you're essentially saying that um, that wasn't sort of how you came to the table. You were trying to create middle ground um, in the stream to batch processing world, um, hence incremental processing. And the whole ACID um, transaction support was basically a, a byproduct. Is that is that fair? Yeah, I, I think that, that, that that's fair because you, you had to build, if you, if you want to build like CDC and upsides deletes, you have to solve asset transactions anyway. So it, 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 it's something that we had to solve in version zero, yeah. like at, at, at two, but before yeah. we can even go live. I would say both came hand in hand, like, you know, because mm. we did have a, a fundamental use case at Uber where we had like lots of these upstream link changing data, like trips and et cetera, uh, you know, which were changing over time. And then, uh, you know, how do you have that represented on through the data lake? And so, we wanted incremental processing, but like sort of acid came along pretty close. Like, mm, mm. so um, well, I think that's that's very helpful information and in sort of understanding how Hoodie came to be and and where it sits in the ecosystem. Um, let's talk about who uses Hoodie. Um, I know that uh, I saw on your on the website on the hoodie.apache.org website. Um, Many companies are using Hudi. Um, yeah. Alibaba, Tencent, Uber, obviously, Udemy. Um, I know there's others that you can't name. Um, financial institutions, um, large tech companies, um, even AWS um, offers Hudi support sort of built into the AWS cloud. Um, obviously, you've seen like lots of great adoption of the project. Um, talk to us a little bit about the main use cases for Hoodie and who uses it most? Yeah, um, so I think uh, we touched upon some of these things. So, you know, if you think about it, some of the, you know, the fundamental questions of like, how do you manage your data for analytics, right? Um, so some of the questions are, okay, can I get my data fast so I can do quick analytics, right? Um, how can I make use of this data? So is this data schematized? You know, is there a contract between you know, my upstream and my downstream consumers. So there's there a schema evolution component to it, right? Um, can I provide isolation guarantees between like readers and writers? Um, can I uh, solve this problem for everybody downstream? As we talked about derived data sets and maybe other data sets off of derived data sets, right? can we solve these problems for, uh, you know, uh, downstream pipelines as well? And then like, you know, advanced stuff, like, you know, how do I make my queries run faster? Can I reorganize my data at rest um, to be able to suit it to more access, like better access patterns that I have? Um, and how can I be more cost efficient? Right? Um, so all of these questions are like, uh, you know, some things that people like, you know, organizations ask at the end of the day who want to do analytics. Um, and those are in organizations that we want to do it. So any, any organization that is looking to solve these problems uh, you know, the interesting thing to note is even if you're not having a specific, uh, like a business use case, you know, uh, 
many of these companies run the services which ingest log data to monitor their applications right and and at the end of the day those those are the use cases which are across any company that is running um, some sort of a service um, and so that company uh, has to solve these problems at the end of the day as well right and then we talked about gdpr and and you know how do we make sure that the data is correct can i restore back to an original state uh, where you know i corrupted my data because of some reason so all of these like questions who, the organizations looking to answer these questions is where hori would would be used well i think i think this um th this question kind of gets to you mentioned the cost savings as well and uh, we actually have a question from uh, a viewer rena is asking how does this mini batch idea help in bringing down cost rather than the bigger batch now you guys might might not um want to describe hoodie as a mini batch uh, uh system because that that means uh, could mean something different um in this in this whole world but um i think i understand the the gist of rena's question right the question is basically how does incremental processing lower the total cost of ownership on running your data pipeline can you give us some examples of that yeah so if you if you take like a typical batch job how how people are are running kind of like edls today let's say you have a source table which has some events and then um you, and then you are building a derived table now where uh you're trying to count a certain type of event every hour or something like that right so now typically what people do to lay account for later event data or you know things like that you um write a batch job like you know essentially you you fully read all of the few hours of data or the entire days data and you run a job every 3 hours 6 hours whatever the cadence be and then fully recompute the target partition and then keep overwriting it right insert overwrite that's what most etls do but if you think about it uh, from the last time that you ran the etl probably very little has changed in the source data set right so but you are recomputing and rewriting the entire thing so if you if you build this kind of pipeline in a in a kind of like a the incremental fashion what you would do is you would like have a target hoodie table with you know a key as the event type and the hour plus r or something and then you would accumulate counts for that r in the target table and then you would incrementally just pull new changes that are happening in the source hoodie table and then kind of compute the delta and then add it to the target table right so this as you can imagine makes your processing sort of uh, a function of um like the amount of total data actually changed rather than the entire input size right and and you can i can construct like much harder kind of are are you know much bigger uh, uh, like uh, use cases where you don't so if the data changes for all the part, like a last 100 partitions last 10 partitions so that bounds your size of recompute and depending on the size of the table uh, i i say i would guess that today with a batch job you either you are over you know you're using way more resources to recompute or ignoring a lot of those and then you know you have data quality fidelity issues right so that's 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 kind of how how like incremental processing can really really help you and and so key to this is this notion of of upserts right and upserts are complicated um they've been complicated in databases well just sort of by definition they're complicated because of race conditions and other challenges um seems like you guys had to tackle this problem with upserts head on um and how did you how did you think about that and how did you ultimately design the system to be able to handle um these these scenarios elegantly um yeah so upserts we we hudi hudi is built on like kind of mvcc principles so we we always just version new data and then we at a very high level we track the we have a transaction log which we call the hudi timeline where we record every change that happens in the database um and and kind of like you know we have per record metadata about when what what transaction a particular record was touched in so with these things we are able to actually always give you the latest uh, committed version of a record um while uh, we, the background processes that we have will make sure that 
you know, as new versions are made, old versions are cleaned. Uh, if you use uh, if you use the kind of the merge and read uh, story like table type in Houdini, uh, it'll make sure that the row based format that you quickly ingested gets merged with the base file to bound your read amplification things like that. So honestly, we followed most of existing standard database techniques, uh, and the fact that we don't uh, so. You can say we we support like a like a you know subset of the database features, right? We don't our RDBMS like MySQL does way more. It'll be unfair to compare what we've done to kind of all the good stuff that they built, right? We don't have any foreign key transactions. We don't have like cross table ta trans ta table transactions yet. We are working on them, uh, but we also picked a simpler subset of the the database features to implement, which makes this kind of like more more tenable and practical mm -hmm. And analytic use cases are notoriously like very single writer focus, right? Or you have like, uh, uh, like you know, a single writer, but some background process that is doing backfill or something, some maintenance kind of thing. So we, we basically solve this problem of, okay, you can write and then do cleaning and all these async uh, bookkeeping processes in parallel, that concurrency control we've solved. So uh, that that makes the system like kind of like you know very self-contained, but also for the uh, so a lot of this we we will see how we can tackle this um, without introducing a new kind of like a server into the architecture. If we want to do foreign key constraints or things like that, uh, it, it'll I think it'll get like more uh, tricky and we'll get into more fundamental database challenges like what you are alluding to. But for now, for the feature sets that people seem very happy with, it's 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 working very well. Yeah. And, and aren't there, there's two, Nish, Nishis, I want, I want you to jump in here because I think there's there's two different ways that Hoodie handles upserts, um, if I'm not mistaken. Do you want to elaborate on that a little bit more? Are there, there, are two, there are two modes for Hoodie to run in or explain that to me a little bit. I came across something in the documentation, but I'm trying to understand more. So, I mean, uh, so on, on the upsert spot, right? Like there, um, so it, just like how a database would do, you need to add, you, whenever you do upserts, you need to figure out where this data goes on disk. So Hoodie has this pluggable index model, right? So we, we have an indexing mechanism that we use to actually do upserts while at the same time create a balance of how uh, efficient can we do when we are merging data on the plan. So like, for example, merge on read. So, um, so, so we, we do like those kinds of uh, like, you know, implementations to create this balance. Uh, but uh, for upsert itself, I mean, there are different uh, ways to um, begin that. Uh, the internal mechanism is, is the same, um, uh, but there are different ways to do that. And, uh, you know, uh, so Hoodie provides, for example, three tools, the Delta Streamer, uh, the uh, sort of Spark data source way, where you can write like a Spark DAG and then a low level uh, Spark RDD based API, which uh, we built uh, first when we started off. And then we support two different file formats uh, or other table formats, uh, which is like copy on write and like merge on read. Um, and then, um, you know, upserts work differently where in copy on write, we do that in situ where the file is rewritten. And then the NBCC uh, pattern with the timeline transaction log guarantees what you're reading uh, versus merge on read where we log that delta and then you know, whenever you read it it's merged on the fly um, so that those are the different modes um, uh, uh, which are supported based on do you want low latency ingestion or do you want low latency queries um, and so you can switch between these two got it and is there a uh, is one of those usages more common than the other based on um, the, the typical use cases that you see? So we started off with uh, copy on write. Um, so that's, so, you know, for log append data where you're just appending a bunch of data, which are not, which is not getting changed. Uh, people right now tend to use copy on write because you get like columnar read performance out of the box. Uh, but for a lot of these like changing data or you want really low T latency, right? Like you go into that five minute ranges, then you would use merge on read. But uh, so th there isn't any like, like the, the copy on write is sort of very like battle tested, been there since the beginning uh, and merge on read, there are more and more new features that we are adding there. 
but depending on the use case, people choose uh, either one of those. So as a project, I think overall, uh, as we go further and further, we would want to kind of make merge and read more of the staple, um, like the table type, while uh, we build a lot of the machinery um, we have already built, for example, like if you do merge and read, you don't have to run a separate compactor. It can run a compactor kind of in line with the ingestion if, if you need. If you, like for example, for copy and write, uh, there's very little like extra you need to do rather than just write, write a spark job and write data. But for merge and read, you need to figure out how to run your compaction job, right? So we, we're trying to make this more and more easier so that people would uh, prefer to do merge and read as the table type, but we also like educator users that, hey, like if you pick merge and read, there is, it's definitely more advanced. So it has like a little bit more bells and whistles. So if you want to keep things operationally very, very simple, you can just stick to copy and write for now. Mm -hmm. uh, we internally try to make that barriers go away. Um, for the project, I think eventually if we can make copy and write just a subset of a merge and read configuration, I think that's sort of like where I would want to go. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's a good segue to talk a little bit about some of the design principles behind the project. Um, how would you articulate those? Yeah, so I think at the, at the very core uh, level, we wanted to provide two primitives, ability to change data sets and ability to capture data off of the, the, the change data off of the data sets, right? And so we designed it very similar to kind of our inspiration sort of was uh, like OLTP databases. How do they track uh, this sort of thing? So we have like a, like a redo log like timeline, which helps us. So we, we're, we're, we're design principle, every, we are very log based. We try to log everything and then we try to compact the log to make sense of things. Like, so there's a timeline in which um, which kind of like records uh, not just the things that happen, uh, but also things that are in flight uh, that is kind of used for coordination across the, say, the background processes and uh, the, the writers and in, 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 a, in a very uh, similar way, like how, say, your redo logs would function. And then, but uh, unlike redo logs in databases, which can actually store data uh, if you, in some configurations, right? This mostly stores transaction handles, and kind of what data actually changed in each transaction. So it like stores a lot more pointers in the transaction log. Um, and then essentially we fend, so every read first looks at the log uh, or like we are building a compacted version of the log, which can just be used to, you know, serve, uh, like figure out essentially if you say, what are the files in this partition without actually having to list the part, partition on S3 or HDFS. But essentially the, the log in some form is the source of truth. Every read is fenced by the log. And then that, that way we never, like you, you never get to query uncommitted data or like in-flight transactions, dirty data that they are writing uh, and things, uh, things like that. That's, that's how the guts of it is, is designed as. Um, our CDC is very modeled after, again, like the, the, the database CDC products that you will find there. Uh, right now, we don't have all the full capabilities. Like typically, those provide like an old and a new um, record uh, for any change. Uh, right now, we just provided the, the latest value. So those are things that we want. We are, but but we have the designs to actually support those features down the line. But more and more and more, we want to actually provide pretty much what a database CDC would give you uh, as a chain stream out of the data set as well. So we are, we're still very close to kind of the, the database uh, design. The other aspect is indexing. So like, if you think about Rudy, we, we thought about it as, okay, this is like a database, but it is a lot more scale, data scale than a OLTP database because it stores data forever. Uh, and it has like, you know, and then it is columnar files. But so we essentially wanted the writes to behave like a, more close to a record level OLTP write, but the reads to be optimized for analytical columnar scans, as opposed to kind of OLTP databases where they're optimized for point lookup P kind of queries, right? So that's sort of like the, a good, good way to like uh, internalize kind of the design principle behind it. And this is internally represented um, 
uh, as parquet, uh, you, you chose to use parquet files internally, is that right? Yeah, we have, uh, we support parquet file format, but for since uh, like Vinod mentioned that write is closer to like sort of a record level, right? We also support an Avro based format, which is like row level. So um, for, for like sort of fast ingestion and logging sort of models, uh, we have Avro and then uh, we, we support like parquet um, for any columnar performance. Although we, our log itself is designed in a way that you could log uh, sort of parquet bits also at like, you know, smaller like granularity, which makes it closer to uh, a row level trend, like right. Uh, but that's something that we're still working on how to model parquet so that then the readers would direct, get direct, uh, you know, columnar uh, performance read, uh, even if you're doing very, very closer to like row level writes. Mm -hmm. So we have another question from Andrew. Um, since you brought up the, the merge on read tables before, Andrew is asking, can you do incremental queries on merge on read tables? Yeah, we, we just added support. Uh, so we always had incremental uh, readers for Hive. We added that for Spark and Presto as well. Uh, Presto. So Presto is not yet there, it's in the works. So, uh, so the one qualification is this works on Spark SQL, as in like Spark through Hive Metastore. Uh, the next release, we will have a native, native support for incremental queries on MOR just using Spark, you know, the, the data source format, basically. Uh, the, the two ways to use uh, Spark, right? One is spark.read.format hoodie. So that doesn't have MOR incremental support yet. Uh, there's a PR open, I think it'll, it'll, it'll just land in the next, next release, but it works through other two modes. And another question from Rina, since we're taking questions at the moment. Um, every time I write something new to my hoodie table, a new file version appears. I thought of limiting it to just one version, but how will this affect my point in time queries? Uh, I think, uh, did you want to take that? Is it Sure. I mean, uh, so if they are performing upserts uh, onto the data and you are using sort of copy on write to create your file versions, uh, then you would have to keep the number of file versions if you want to go back in time. Um, uh, there are ways to uh, produce, uh, we, have, we have something called save points, uh, which, you know, if you don't want to uh, keep all versions of the data from like say point A, like time A to time B, you can say, I want to save point my data at time A, delete all the intermediate versions and then have the latest data. So you could do that for, as an optimization if you, you know, care about storage space, but time traveling and point in time queries also come at a cost of storage. So uh, that's, that's kind of the trade-off that I, I, I feel. So one thing I would like to add, even for non snapshot queries, like, you know, not the point in time queries about file retention is we also keep the, uh, files around for like 10, 10 hours or some time-based interval that is tunable. This is done because uh, all the engines basically like Presto, Hive, Spark just materialize the plan up front. So like, let's say you have a long Hive query which is running for four hours. It, you wrote a, like a commit and it produced a file. The Hive query started running on that, right? And then if you produce new versions in, in the next one hour and delete that original version, the Hive query is going to eventually fail, right? Because it cannot find the original file because that's how Hive materializes the plan or like you know, any other engine up front. This is something that we would like to be fixed in the query engines lazily so that they can pick the latest version of a given file group or something. But for now, that's not how they work. So we also keep the files around for this purpose. Like the, the I think the default is based on kind of what we ran at Uber, which was well, uh, the maximum time length for a Hive query was 12 hours. So we keep the file around for 12 hours. Otherwise, you'll just be frustrated by Hive queries failing, like ETS failing and coming back and reading and failing and coming back and reading. Uh, this is like another, another interesting kind of thing that jumped out. And it shows how ingrained this whole ecosystem was to the fact that files don't change. Right? <laughs> yeah. So uh, we got a couple more questions. This is great. Uh, is Spark 3.0.0 .0 .0 supported? 
that's something that we are working on right now it should it will be available in the next release i mean this uh, yeah there's a pr open we need to yeah. certify it it will it, be all right great um Andrew Padilla is asking any experiments on how persistent memory may improve the performance of Houdini? Um, no, but we would like to hear from you if you can run those experiments and just, you know, come on and join the, the you know, we really love these kind of like discussions in the community, but yeah, we haven't really done much. Great. Um, Andrew, that's a call out to you and to anyone else in the community. Um, who wants to contribute to the project. I know that Vinod and Nishith are always um, bugging me for contributors. So now I'm bugging you um, here live so that uh, you can all throw your hat in the ring and help make this project even more awesome. Yeah. How about... Um, no, no, go ahead, go ahead, Nisha. I was just saying it's a great time to start contributing as well. There's like some, like a really interesting roadmap ahead. Um, you know, uh, there are some like pretty like fundamental things that we're also working on. Um, so, you, so, you know, you can get to uh, uh, contribute to some fundamental aspects of the project. Um, so I would say it's like, a great time to like start contributing. That's great. Um, and I know there's, there's folks in the community that are aware of um, some other seemingly overlapping projects. Um, someone's asking about Iceberg and um, how you might compare or contrast with Iceberg. So perhaps it's worth mentioning, um, you know, since obviously it's important for you to continue to get um, contributions from the community, um, you wanna be able to articulate to folks like why they would choose Hootie over some other project. Um, like, how would, you, how would you phrase that? Like what's most meaningful or what's most unique about where Hootie's at um, compared to Iceberg? Not that one is, you know, better or worse, but um, we know as engineers that we're always making trade-offs and optimizations. Um, so how do you think um, who do you might compare or contrast with um, other the projects that are out there doing apparently similar things? So uh, maybe I'll, I'll start with an answer based on where, where things are today because like all, all these projects are kind of like like work and flight, they're moving very quickly. So it's, it's kind of like very hard to have the conversation about like what each project could build. But right now, like uh, Hoodie is a great choice for you if you have, um, you know, uh, inserts and updates, um, and you want to actually, you know, build incremental data pipelines. And Hoodie does a lot of things. Uh, uh, so Iceberg, as I understand it, is is kind of like a table format, uh, just like Parquet is a file format. Iceberg is a table format, which gives you ways to write to a table and then like manage metadata on the table. Iceberg has solved some very good uh, problems around on the query side, um, like file listings uh, and also, um, you know, like column column pruning stuff uh, from from what, what I can read. And so right now, if you think about it, uh, Hoodie offers a lot of the capabilities for you to write data very well, while giving you out of the box kind of query sub like query performance that you're. Apache Spark or Apache Hive and like Presto give you out of the box, while Iceberg gives you a table format and uh, like ways to efficiently like a layer, a metadata layer on top, which helps you, you know, maybe use I Iceberg's query uh, engines to kind of like read uh, the, the queries in a more optimized way, right? So that that's how the two projects stand uh, at this point, uh, like, Hoodie, obviously, like the, the alluding to the question before, right? To solve upsets and deletes, we needed to solve transactions and we needed to solve the table format problem as well. So Hoodie internally has its own table format, like in, in, in a way, like way it represents metadata, way it writes uh, files and reads files, right? So, but we also have built a lot of machinery around the file, uh, like the table format, like for example, uh, if you know the snapshots in the date table, uh, you still have to write code to kind of diff these snapshots and build a cleaning algorithm, which can like, re like remove older snapshots in the table and things like that, right? So Hoodie is kind of built with all these bells and whistles bundled in. Um, down the line, uh, it actually, you can actually conceive maybe Iceberg as a table format supported underneath Hoodie, if you can abstract and make it work. Uh, in, in that way, um, 
but these are like very very early thoughts i don't want to promise anything uh, but that's how i i would i position both both the both the projects uh, per se uh, yeah mm-hmm. i think um, um and also has uh, you know th- just like what vinod mentioned i think the the writer part is like you know like the way we uh, approached it when we actually developed it was like we wanted to get these massive amounts of data so we like we've solved the writer part really well uh, right and and we've obviously had to lay out the data because we always had this there's always a state up of how fast you can ingest how fast you can query can they both be in similar formats etc so we've solved the aspects of how fast can we ingest how can we do that trade off and 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 i think iceberg is sort of saying okay i can manage this data after you've written it um and 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 you know can can both of them sort of like overlay each other's like something that i think we know to talk about so who is get, going to get like some of the like the like similarish features like uh, file listing um and mostly because we can actually do it very cheaply easily because we already have a log of all the changes and that's kind of like battle tested for over the years in reality why we didn't do that was mostly uber specific uh, reasons where uber was running hdfs right and if you we decided to scale the this metadata layer the hdfs layer rather than uh, investing in the layer above and f- like kind of kind of like you know forcing everyone to use the same data library maybe there are people who don't want to write uh, using uh, uh, huli for that data set right uh, we have a lot of like you know non parquet data as well so general that problem was solved at a more hdfs level that we just didn't get funded uh yearly on basically but now i think with a lot more users adopting it on s3 and like cloud storage this is like a problem that comes up and then we like we already are testing like uh, some solution around that all that said in the spirit of like kind of open source and community i would love there to be like clear kind of like you know um, like scope for each project uh, in in some sense so that contributors who are spending like their volunteer time or extra time like how we are spending building the project can actually be efficiently like you know contribute focus their time towards like one project like in in some sense right uh, mm-hmm. that that's that's kind of how how i for the broader uh, interest of the the open source community i think yeah it it, it probably you know make sense to have at least uh, all the platform components that we have maybe work on both formats but but i think some of these problems will get solved in hudi anyway mm-hmm. okay um another question from andrew he's asking how are the merge on read compaction scheduled um so uh, th- so that's configurable um so there are different strategies that you could choose to you know figure out what is the compaction that you want you could have an io based compaction you can have like a partition based compaction uh, you could choose a time based compaction so there are different strategies that are supported um uh, the there is a automatic spar- uh, compaction scheduling mechanism so i think there is a spark structured streaming model which you can use to have like you know long running job which can automatically schedule compactions based on the strategy that you define or you can schedule them like manually uh via your ingestion job and then have an asynchronous compaction job sort of compact this based on the strategies and uh, the the strategies can be like broken down so you can have multiple asynchronous compactions running uh, hudi is de- is designed in a way that with using mvcc you can have multiple compact so if you want to so at uber for example we compact latest data quickly uh, and then older data more slowly uh, because we don't care so much about the old data um being uh, you know available in like let's say columnar format so that's how we deploy it um and, and like you could choose any on any strategy and deploy it great so um we're almost out of time guys but i i wanted to ask you um speaking of the future of the project and sort of what's coming around around the pipe um what are you most excited about in terms of the upcoming roadmap for hudi Yeah so i think as we not mentioned like a couple of things that are like uh, imminently like being worked on is uh, file listing so we're uh, you know since hudi was designed on hdfs 
we thought we had ways to scale it that way, but it seems like there are other systems like S3, which are designed differently, uh, at least as of as, as far as I'm aware in spe certain specific scenarios. So uh, in our next release, we are uh, sort of eliminating file listing, um, right? And, and the other thing that we're working on is, um, so as you can imagine, you know, as you're ingesting large amounts of data, uh, you're trying to tune it for scale, uh, but you know, as users you know, read this data, that, that pattern changes over time. Um, and you know, to understand how to lay out your data based on access pattern um, is, is sort of something that like, we're working on. So there's this project called clustering where we could move around the data based on query access pattern to make it more efficient. Um, and then I know there, there's like strong community support to like refactor some of the things to bring Cody on Flink. And then there are a couple of other things I think we know uh, you may also wanna add there. Yeah, so the other part is uh, the, I, I think on similar lines as the listing problem, right? Which is uh, right now we have an indexing mechanism which uses, uh, we actually have a few ways of indexing. Indexing is basically trying to say when you're upserting this given record, you want to quickly figure out which file it dirties basically. Uh, so we have like a version with H, HBase uh, that we deploy uh, use uh, uh, outside for people who have a HBase key value store. Right, we have a built-in one that is based on join uh, that we launched in point six called simple indexing. We also have one which is based on Bloom index, um, Bloom filters, some kind of range information about the keys uh, that outperforms uh, like a simple join-based uh, kind of you know indexing mechanism that you find in say Delta or something or, or the simple indexing GUI itself uh, for kind of changing fact tables. But the one problem that we've had is, say you have a user stable, and then like it randomly gets updated. Uh, none of these are very efficient. The HBase index can perform very well, but you need HBase. Uh, so we are also working on like a record level indexing mechanism, which can actually give you maybe like uh, you know close to uh, HBase ish performance uh, for for random lookups. Um, and then this, this we believe can be like a fundamentally uh, new feature in Hoodie um, that can mm -hmm. solve the, the, the one class of use cases for which there isn't a good solution out there today. Mm -hmm. And by way of doing that, the other problem is the existing Bloom index, um, like we store the key ranges in Parquet file footers. So we are also thinking about building a, like a separate range index uh, out, uh, just like the record index and uh, which, which can actually be used to quickly prune files based on key ranges. And this will also be exposed to the query engine kind of like side in a subsequent release. Uh, the next point on release will have these features and we are very, very excited about, about these. And the, the very cool thing that's happening out there in the code right now is we're refactoring the code so that all of these are built as like internally as other hoodie tables. So we are also in some sense, we, we might get multi-table transactions as well because we need the mechanism to keep the data, the parquet data table and the, all these like metadata and like index tables in sync. So we have to solve that problem. And we, we have a like, th those are the, the core areas of focus. Uh, and of course, like people are working on JDBC, uh, you know, like at the, at the platforming level, like right? the, the outside, we're working on uh, JDBC uh, incremental pulling so that you don't have to run scoop and then run Delta streamer. You can just like run Delta streamer and pull from uh, JDBC kind of tables. And we are trying to improve schema evolution for the Kafka connectors and like a lot of like ingestion law will probably add, uh, be working on like hardening the, the, the bulk bulk import ingestion tool a lot more. And then the one other thing that the major feature that we introduced in point six was the ability to kind of bootstrap an existing parquet data set as a hoodie data set with the indexing and the incremental capability without losing any functionality basically. And we, I think it's kind of like experimental even though we like, you know, for we want to take few users and kind of harden it over. And that again, um, is a very practical way for you to adopt Hoodie at a large scale for your entire data lake because you can run, keep your old data set 
and then you can you need not copy data around to build the new hoodie data set uh, you can keep the old pipelines running uh, as long as you don't delete the original files right hoodie will just keep work of a snapshot of your old data and then you can now count verify your hoodie table and your old table and you decide to cut over when you can right so that is a thing that we see we we are seeing a lot of large users who are moving entire platform like the data lakes over to hoodie those users need lot more uh, tooling and this set of like mechanism for them to be able to go you know convince their management that hey i'm mm-hmm. like, trusting all our data with this thing and i can recover it i can still run both the pipelines and validate the data is good and all, all of that stuff right these are like uh, we are also planning to like harden that lot more and then it will be the, the the supported way um to like you know kind of like bring big new hudi data sets we are hoping well those are a lot of exciting changes um coming down the road so we'll look forward to that um just as a sign off question i'm curious uh, to know from you guys what what was the most surprising thing you learned uh, as engineers either about uh, the way people use the tool would respond to the tool about yourselves um, what's the most surprising thing that you learned through this project do you know what you said sure i think um, i think i briefly touched upon it like the initial surprising thing for me is like okay like you know <laughs> why isn't anybody solving it but I think the the more surprising thing was the way we started okay we we want to solve this problem but it's just amazing to see how the community has grown and Guri is helping solve many other data application problems we didn't touch upon them for example machine learning and uh, you know mm. like we are like these are like things that we we never at least I never expected uh, and uh, at least when we were building it out and like the number of data applications now using it um are like many many like disparate type of applications that was like mm. kind of the most like um surprising as well as gratifying uh part that's re- that's rewarding for sure for for me i think is similar kind of sentiment i i'm just surprised that uh, in, in a way like in, in this place that how how broadly applicable this uh this kind of like going back to that blog right how true that remains even today and then how broadly it's become applicable i remember telling ishit when like we were like this first like you know kind of joining the project that hey look like either this is this thing is going to like change how we do data processing like in you know, a fundamental level or it will at least be a good way to build like, incrementally in just databases either way it's a fun problem that we can put on our resumes but yeah that that's the part that really <laughs> surprised us on a more inward looking note um for personally for me um i think the the first year of building hudi uh, from 2016 to you know 17 right the headwinds uh, just for me personally the con- like going building something that was very kind of thought very anti pattern at that time um i think what i realized was after it, it, it took me a little bit while to come out of that i i questioned myself a lot more about hey i may actually like doing something more complicated uh, where i shouldn't be uh, like the 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 this whole uh, file listing column index thing is a great example we had that idea we still have the design doc in uber from 2017 we didn't do it because we thought okay like this is already a large change and let's see people first like adopt that and we go forward but in retrospect i felt like yeah that's the one take away i have is like i should like you know should have trusted my instincts maybe a little bit more and just keep grounding on technical facts uh i th- that's that's one learning mm-hmm. personally i had uh, as a growth moment through through this mm-hmm. yeah i i would completely agree with that same here well that's exciting because um it's it's really a little bit like building a company right um as as a founder um who has built engineering tools before i know like how important it is to get at adoption and to have people get excited about the paradigm that you're using to explain the problem or the solution and so um you guys were fortunate that you were able to see traction um uh, e- even in you know in with your crazy ideas if you will um you know early on and so that sort of gave you some unction to to continue 
um, to, to go down that road and to um, continue to expand on those ideas. So um, congrats for getting this far. Um, it's great to see who really progress. And I hope that you get some contributors um, and some users um, out of this conversation. So thanks for joining us, guys. I really appreciate it. Right. Thanks for right. having us. These are really great questions. And like, yeah, really, really appreciate it. Yeah, this was a right. fun conversation. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I just want to end by uh, mentioning also our thanks to IBM, who is a sponsor of this episode. And IBM is a supporter of the open source community. Um, and they invite you to check out their data science community, uh, a link to which we'll put in the chat. Um, you can check that out for um, online resources, content and support for data professionals. Also, um, if you don't mind, please share a bit of feedback with us in the form um, that's also posted in the chat. It helps us improve DC Thursdays. It helps us know what you wanna hear about. Um, it, it, it really is an inspiration to us um, as we continue to do these episodes uh, for the benefit of the community. And um, I wanted to mention that our next guest uh, on September 10th will be Wes McKinney, who's the, the author or co-author of the Apache Arrow Project. Um, so we're really looking forward to having Wes and you'll be seeing more details um, from us in the future um, in the coming weeks. Uh, but mark your calendars for September 10th for our next DC Thursdays with Wes McKinney.